Welcome to this episode of Growth Island. This is an episode that I've really been looking forward to because I got one of the biggest stars in the world, actually, when it comes to personal development. I got the honor of having no other than the John Gray on the podcast. If you don't know his name straight away, you definitely know his book because he's the author of the most well-known and trusted relationship book of all times called Men are from Mars and Women are from Venus. When I was young, I didn't know what that meant, but I heard about men are from Mars and women are from Venus. So this is something that has had an impact on millions of people and people growing up learning about relationship. But the cool thing about John is that he's continued to evolve. He's actually written 20 books. But the reason why I am so excited to have him on this podcast is because I both listened to his book that has been helping generations uh, of getting better relationship. But he wrote a new book that I absolutely love. Because as you know from the podcast, I love to go into like, how does the body actually work? And he's been taking this to the next level and writing beyond Mars and Venus, where he goes into what do these different hormones actually do in our bodies and how does that affect our relationships? How are men and women actually different? And what do we know from the science right now? And it is so empowering to learn about some of these different things. So John, thank you so much for contributing to all of our relationships and uh, finding the time for this uh, interview. I'm really happy to be with you a lot and, and particularly happy because you've read both Men Are From Mars and Beyond Mars and Venus. You've got the old version and the new version because the world has changed. It definitely has, but some things are still the same and now we know more about how men and women are different. So I'm coming from Denmark, as you know, and in Scandinavia we have some gender neutrality or like uh, even in Sweden, they have the no gender. Um, are men and women actually different? Well, in many ways, we're not different at all. And certainly in the old fashioned ways, we're not different in those ways. But in other ways, we're still different. We, we have these brains that took about a millions of years to evolve. And as a species, we have to first start out by recognizing that most of our brain is animal brain, okay? The, the DNA of most of our brain is monkey or snake. And we do have part of our brain which is unique from animals. And certainly the organization of the brain is quite different. But so many things are the same. You know? And also, when you look at me, you'll see my nose is my father's. My eyes are my mother's. My lips are my mother's, at least when I was younger. And my hair is my father's. So you see, so many of the physiological traits come into our body from our parents. And biologically, there's a lot of differences between men and women. And by under the point of this is by understanding those differences, it can really help our relationships. And we can learn like hack hacking our brain and our body. We can hack our relationships so that we can experience a lifetime of passion, sexual attraction, making love. This is like really wonderful stuff. And ironically, when I go around the world teaching Mars Venus ideas, I do a poll, you know, what do people want me to teach? And almost everybody wants me to teach how to keep the sexual attraction, how to keep the romance is another way of saying it, how to feel that connection. And a lot of people go, oh, you can't, you can't. That's what it is. And a lot of people think you should be able to, and then they're disappointed when they can't and they get a divorce. So it's a matter of whether you lower your expectations back to, to the old fashioned relationships or you raise your expectations to what's possible, but you don't know how to do it. And so that's what I focus on because I'm an example of somebody who's had great passion throughout his whole marriage. I know how to do it. I've counseled other people how to do it. And my wife has passed three years ago. I'm 70 and we had it up to the last year of our marriage i mean she had cancer so we stopped at that point but we, we made love it without the sex part my taking care of her was so so special but it's possible and i know what made it work and i've helped other people do it and a big part of keeping that attraction is being aware that inside of me as a man there's a male side and a female side inside of every woman is a male side and a female side and if i'm if my male side is weak, my female side will be strong and there'll be no passion, there'll be no attraction. It's like magnets. The masculinity is attracted to femininity, femininity is attracted to masculinity. Now, when femininity is weak, it loses its attraction to masculinity. And when masculinity is weak, 
it loses attraction to femininity. So in, if we can learn in our work world, who cares about the romance, right? <laughs> but in our relationship, we can practice ways of communicating, which we'll talk about, hmm. ways of understanding our partner so that we can maintain that attraction we felt in the beginning. And it's so wonderful to lighten up the relationship and, and not demand that our partner think the way we do, feel the way do we do, react the way we do, but to truly understand women, where they're coming from. Because no matter how liberal you are, men sometimes think their wives are crazy. And, and, and no matter how loving you are as a woman and free you are and independent you are, you start to think that men are narcissists, men are emotionally unavailable, men are jerks, and men are a-holes. You know, it just, you can just hear the language and we're not, we're all these amazing people. We just don't know how to interact and understand each other. And it's so much fun to be able to share these ideas. I think it's fantastic. I, so I read the two books. I know you've written 20 books, but I read two of them. I've been following you for some years as well, seeing that you've been quite active in the biohacking community, which first, when I saw your name at a biohacking conference, uh, I think it was in London, uh, I was like, that's the guy that talks about relationship. And then I started looking more into your work and that one thing is like the, the relationship advice, but that have you actually taken into a biological sense of understanding what gives us energy, what makes attraction and so on. So I would love to get more into that. Uh, one of the things that I found super interesting, especially as a man, reading what's the thing about cave time, that you're writing that men need time to be by themselves once in a while. And that's not that they don't like their partner at all but that's how they reach out and they actually get higher testosterone from that. Yeah, it's so basic. It's, it's if we're all the same and a man takes cave time, a woman thinks, well, he must not love me. He doesn't want to spend time with me. What happened the other day? He wanted to spend time with me and now he doesn't. What's he's jerk. You know, men are often called jerks because women feel jerked around. You know, one day, oh, I can't wait to see you. Let's spend time together, make love together. We enjoy each other. We watch TV together, whatever it might be. We're reading together. And that other times he doesn't even want to talk to me. He wants to be alone. What is it? Did I do something wrong? Did he not love me anymore? No, he is a man and every man, this is every man, but in different degrees, granted, every man needs time to have his testosterone go up. Why does he need that? Because when you see what makes testosterone go up is whenever you're doing something on your own, where you're not depending on anybody. All right. So you're doing something on your own. Now, when a woman is doing something on her own, her testosterone goes up. When a man is doing something on his own, his testosterone goes up. When you do things together, when you're intimate and you feel more caring and loving and support, and you're depending on that other person for you to feel really good too, that's interdependence, that's relationship, estrogen levels go up. So why don't we understand this in terms of why testosterone is so important for men, why estrogen is so important for women? This is where we have a nice thing in science. Science tells us that when a woman, women generally, and when they're feeling good, their estrogen levels need to be at least 10 times higher than a man's. Yeah. And for a man to feel good, his testosterone has to be 10 times higher than a woman's. This is biology. You can test any man who's depressed and his testosterone levels will be low like a woman's. It, low. And when he's feeling good, it's 10 times higher. And when he's feeling romantic, it's 20 times higher than a woman's. Now, women have a little tiny amount of testosterone when they're making love. For men, it's way, way up here. And when it's just feeling good, like right now, I'm feeling really good. My testosterone levels will be 10 times or 20 times higher than your average woman's testosterone. And if I'm angry, ironically, it's not testosterone. If I'm angry, My estrogen levels are high. See, anger is an emotion. Positive or negative emotions doesn't matter. Emotions is estrogen. Detachment is testosterone. So when I'm with my wife and I love her so much, I'm with my kids, I want to spend time with them, with, my heart's opening, right? This is that gives color to my life, makes me feel wonderful with my family. It's a beautiful thing. My estrogen's going higher and higher and higher. And estrogen can tend to lower testosterone. Because I'm no longer detached. <laughs> now connected. This is my family. I love them so much. Estrogen is going up and testosterone tends to go down. So when that happens, I need to detach 
and go over to my purely independent side, which is not depending on her for my happiness in any way. And that is, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with that. If you go back in time, the Buddha, he said, you know, you need to forget your problems. I mean, wouldn't women be happier if they could forget their problems? Unfortunately, they can't. But we men can. <laughs> we can detach. We can say, forget it. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to go off and do something to feel good and have fun. Now, that's a guy. And what Buddha taught was meditate, okay? So you can just forget your problem, be alone all by yourself, be independent. You can fast. You know, fasting is a huge testosterone producer. Discipline. You go to the gym and you work out. That's discipline. You know, and it, it, this is the, some of the male qualities that women have and men have. The difference is that when women are doing male qualities, they might be more successful. They feel good and they feel their self-esteem of their male side goes up. Look what I can do. Look what I can do. But that doesn't lower her stress. What lowers her stress is when her estrogen levels are 50 times, uh, 10 times higher than a man's. And at certain parts of the month, it needs to be 20 times higher than a man's. Uh, and if it's not, then she's not feeling happy and fulfilled. And if you can have those moments where you're together, and he actually can help support her raising her estrogen up higher and higher. And how can he do that? By doing things that are traditionally old-fashioned romance. For example, we go on a date. It's not something I want to do, but I'm happy to do it because it's what she wants to do. It's about her. It's not like this time we do you, the next time we do me. No, a romantic date is when I do something for her. And then she goes, oh, I feel so good. I feel so special. I feel so beautiful. I feel... You know, I don't have to do everything myself. He's doing something for me. So that's where you bring some of these old fashioned. They're, to me, that I old fashioned, it's the wisdom of the past. But you see, today, women can be on their male side. That's great. They couldn't in the past. So they feel claustrophobic. They feel repressed, oppressed, whatever. They're free to go to their male side. But then it feels so good to go over there. It's hard to get back and do what nourishes their soul. That same thing for men. I was in the 60s. I was a hippie. I grew my hair out. I had fancy outfits, bell-bottom pants, boots, big buckle, beads, demonstrated for peace during the Vietnam War. This was all non-manly stuff. This is all feminine. I went to my female side. And because I was so far on my male side before that, growing up in Houston, Texas, you know, I'm a Texan. I'm a rancher, you know, cowboy, you know, and then suddenly I go become a hippie. Going from my male side to my female side, it feels fantastic. But you got to learn how to get back to your male side. And men go too far to their female side. What happens? Their estrogen goes up, their testosterone goes down, and they become needy. They become addicted. They're not able to make commitments. They don't work hard. They pout. They can't make a commitment in a relationship. And you can actually measure they have low testosterone at those times and high estrogen even when a man is angry or at violence you want to know when a man is violent his testosterone is very low his estrogen is high see he has all that emotion of anger or fear defensiveness irritability grumpiness all those qualities that men start to have in relationships it's because they love their partner so much they're their estrogen side and nobody teaches them cave time you have to have cave time. And particularly a guy like me and a guy like Mads, big hearts. So we say, okay, I need to go spend time alone. And our wives will say, oh, but don't you want to be with me? You hurt my feelings. Don't you care about me? And we go, yes, I care about you. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> and we don't take our cave time. But see, this is so important for women to understand men. And men need to understand women, which is why she would... You know, what does she need when she's stressed? Well, what she needs is more estrogen. We know when she's stressed, her estrogen levels are low. It's like she's drawing her sword. She has to solve problems and fix things, be safe. That's her testosterone side. Okay, it's good. Now you have that. That's fantastic. But now can you come back to your softer side, your vulnerable side? And what is vulnerability? Let's look at that because that's misunderstood. But it's a big word today because... What men are attracted to most is a woman in her vulnerability. And what women need most to be happy is to be vulnerable. And what does vulnerability mean? It means I'm letting you affect me. See, that's what romance is. A woman is letting a man affect you. And so you can be, when you're happy, you're vulnerable. When you're joyful, you're vulnerable. When you're grateful, you're vulnerable. When you're hurt, you're vulnerable. 
When you're angry, you're vulnerable. When you're sad, you're vulnerable. All those qualities are estrogen stimulating qualities. It's just that when you use the negative estrogen stimulating qualities, it tends to push down his testosterone. <laughs> if you get upset with him, it just pushes his testosterone down. Learn how to use the positive side of your estrogen and you have a man always there for you or until he needs to be in his cave. So what's interesting is as a man, I can have a lot of problems today. Then my testosterone goes down because I don't feel successful. So then I need my cave time to rebuild my testosterone. Or I could be spending a lot of, of wonderful romantic time with my partner. Like this last weekend with my partner now, I was officiating someone's wedding. And, you know, we stayed at a beautiful place in Napa and a hotel. We spent all this time together, all this lovey-dovey sharing stuff. And she understands today, I'm going to, yesterday actually it was, I need a lot of cave time. She says, so today, take your cave time. I know we had a great time this weekend. And a lot of women experience that. They go, what happened? What happened? I don't understand. We had such a good weekend together. We had such a special time together. And now he's just like working really hard and ignoring me. Is that men have to go back over to that more detached side, work, business, or play, play that doesn't involve her. So that's the idea of men are from Mars, women are from Venus, the cave time. And I remember doing the Skoblov show, which is very popular there. And unfortunately, I did a, I, I made a mistake. I showed a lot of emotion. Skoblov was actually saying more, more, more. They didn't put that on the camera, but the, the two feminists were all interrupting me all the time. And they got to say everything they wanted. Then they interrupted me. And so I'm like, hey, wait a second. It's my turn. But anyway, having said all that, it was the president of, of Norway who was there. And I was talking about cave time. And I said, now you need to take your cave time. He says, oh, I, I don't take cave time. I don't take cave time. I come home to be with my family. And I said, right before I came out here, y'all were discussing that everybody in Norway was upset with the president of Norway, who was wasting money because he had a protection patrol every day for 30 minutes before he went home while he walked his dog. <laughs> so they're all upset that he was walking his dog and needed security. And that was a waste of money, which to me is, again, funny because it's the richest country around. <laughs> and, anyway, and it's a president. Uh, he's a president. Come on. So anyway, so, but the point is, he walked his dog for 30 minutes before he came home to be this loving husband to his wife. That's what I'm saying. That's his cave time. I talked to another man the other day. And, you know, here we have these long commutes, so much traffic. And some people will take a commuter. It's like a little train. You get on the train and it's like 45 minutes, you get home, right? And then he got a job closer to the place where he could walk from his office to his home. And he says, ever since I went there, I feel terrible when I come home. I don't know what it is. I said, you got to be in a, all by yourself on a train every day for 45 minutes where you didn't have to talk to anybody. You didn't have to care about what they feel, what they think. You could just read the newspaper or read your iPad, just sort of waste some time. And that's called cave time. You're all by yourself doing what you want to do. And then you can come out and say, hey, I'll do whatever you want. I'm here for you. And that's what romance is. But you've got to fuel romance. And sometimes men feel guilty. They feel guilty. So women have to push him into the cave. How can you do that if you don't understand men to realize that's what he needs? And the way you push him out of the cave is you just ignore him. Just go up and do other things. Be happy doing other things that will make him want you more. So understanding these dynamics can help a lot in our relationships. So John, going from now women understand that it's important to give men the cave time and men understand it's important to take that cave time. One of the things that I found in your book that I found really interesting as well was the Venus talk. Yeah, it's such a, a good skill. So this is, remember I talk about vulnerability. Vulnerability is letting somebody affect you or letting things affect you as opposed to nothing bothers me. See, that's your ultimate masculine stance. And I'm not asking men to be that. I'm saying that when you're overly emotional, if you have negative emotions, you need to back off. You know, for men, I, in my old seminars, I would have men watch Kung Fu movies. I say, you know, watch a Kung Fu master. They're disciplined. They know their trait. They know their skill. So they never get flustered. See, that's masculinity, confidence, success, training, you know, this is what we need. And whenever we're flustered, it's because we don't know what to do or what we thought should work didn't work. 
that's why Mars Venus ideas are so important because men think just solving a problem is going to make everybody happy. But sometimes not solving the problem you think is the problem, but understanding what women really need. Sometimes women just need to vent. Vent is just to talk about whatever's bothering them. And if she can talk about what's bothering her and he hears her, she'll feel connection because what she needs, just as a man needs to feel that level of success for testosterone and independence, look what I can do. The flip side of that is women need to feel connection. And one of the most powerful ways to feel connection, particularly in a relationship, is through talking. And then the next would be making love, but and him doing things for you and you doing things for him. But often it's, if you look at, you know, 50 years of experience of being a marriage counselor, right? 99% of everybody who comes in, unha- every woman who comes in unhappy, it, she'll say something like this. I give and I give and I give and I get nothing back. And so she, she basically is keeping score. <laughs> She's giving and giving and giving. And what I don't say to her right away is that, well, I guess you're not very good at receiving. (laughs) It's the art of receiving is the power that women have if they discover it. For men, it's the art of giving. And one of the most powerful things that a man can give to a woman is his attention, his affection, his interest, and then his empathy, and then his service to do things for her. But the key thing for women today, because they're so far on their independent side, they need to come back to their vulnerable side. And a man who's a good listener and a woman who knows how to share her vulnerability, it will bring her right back to estrogen. It will bring her right back to accessing that part of her that loves men, that's turned on by a man, that is appreciative of a man, that is trusting of a man, that's accepting of a man with all his flaws. Nobody's perfect. And it's only when we're in stress mode that the brain starts doing a a test mode. It says, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? And we all do that. That's a a bias that our brain has. When you're experiencing adrenaline response, your brain goes into looking at everything that could be wrong. And then when you have a cortisol response, then you look at everything which is wrong and can't be changed. That's the more extreme. I give up. I give up kind of a thing. And what we see biologically as well, one of the differences between men and women is that when women experience moderate stress, they have eight times more blood flow to the part of the brain that remembers everything that goes wrong. (laughs) And, you know, men often complain, she remembers everything. She complains, he does, he forgets everything. (laughs) It's always forgetting things because when men go through moderate stress, what happens is we, we, we become hyper-focused. Like all you have to do is drive your car a little bit faster than you're supposed to, and you'll become hyper-focused. And you're looking behind you, before you, everywhere. Your brain goes into an altered adrenaline state that doesn't take in more information. It's just hyper-focused. For women, when they go into an adrenaline state, they tend to expand, just the opposite. So whenever I talk to a woman as a counselor and a therapist who's unhappy, uh, dissatisfied, she also is overwhelmed. She says, there's so much to do, not enough support. There's so many problems. There's this, there's this, there's this. It's that feeling of overwhelm is a woman's stress reaction to low estrogen, high testosterone. Because testosterone says, I have to solve the problem. I have to solve the problem. And often for some women, they're really low estrogen. The only problem they have is their husband. (laughs) And so this is a, a... what Hap Freud would explain this is that when you can't express your feelings at work, they get suppressed and then they come out on the person who's safest to you. Mm. So here's the guy who loves you and all your stuff comes out on him. And he becomes the only problem. Because I, I see this again and again and again. Women have these amazing lives and they say, my only problem is him. And I'll give you an example. I wanted to point this out in a seminar and it was in China. And I, I said, I wanted to have a woman who come up front who, whose husband is not the only problem in her life. <laughs> and the translator made a mistake. And the woman who came up, she said, yes, my husband is the only problem in my life. Okay. 
said, actually, it turned out to be work at a good example. I said, so you have no other problems in your life? She says, no. I said, okay, what's your job? And she said, I own seven restaurants. And, and I said, oh, okay. And you manage them all? She says, yes, I manage them all. And I said, well, you know, there's a bit of a financial problem going on now. Does that stress you out? She says, yeah, we're having difficulties right now. I might have to close one. I said, does that cause stress to you? She said, no, there's nothing I can do about it. So I forget it. See, that's the way men process by detachment. And that increases testosterone. It doesn't increase estrogen. What increases estrogen is for her to talk about how that feels. So I kept saying, well, did you have to fire some people? She said, yeah, I have to fire some people. How does that feel? Nothing I can do about it. And I said, now managing all those people and all those businesses, how are they doing? Well, they're not doing it well right now. I said, how does that feel? Well, there's nothing I can do about it. It's business. Business is business. You just do what you have to do. I said, you see, this is the way men think. And that's good for men. <laughs> but not good for you because when you come home, your husband is the only problem in your life. So I'm going to explain to you something is that if you can tell me in great detail, all of the problems of the workday, I'm managing seven restaurants in the accounting and the finances and the hiring and the fire. There's a huge amount of problems and not that you can't handle it. I get that you're a competent superwoman, but you're not turned on to your husband and you're unhappy in your marriage. And he's the only problem. She's, but he is. I said, I don't even need to hear anything about him. What I hear is that you're not in touch with your vulnerable side. There's no one to love. There's no one at home. He can't affect you because he's the problem. When a man is the problem, there's nothing he can do. She's, he can change. I said, no, no. He needs to be loved the way he is. And that will pull forth more of him. That's how you hack a man. You, you give him more and ask for a little bit more. You, you give the love that he needs. Don't do things for him and don't put up with him and don't resent him by thinking, look, all the things I do for him and he's not doing for me, that keeping score thing. No, what you have to do is give him a chance to be successful for you. It used to be men, women could, uh, you could easily love your husband if he went to work and provided for you and you didn't have to work and you thought, gee, I'm such a lucky woman. I can do whatever I want. I run these restaurants, but if they look, if they fail, no problem to me because my husband has a good job and he supports me. I'm just so lucky. But you so don't John, feel that way. The, the Venus talk, the short... Okay, I, I know. I, I build up to it. Thank you for keeping me on track, Matt. You know, I can just go on forever. Okay. So, so the Venus talk is women today, the more they're on their male side, it will help them find their estrogen world. It will help them to regulate stress by learning how to express vulnerable feelings. Now, vulnerable feelings, if you're stressed, will always be frustration or anger, disappointment or sadness, fear, concern, worry, embarrassment, guilt, or shame. Okay, those are just negative emotions that when you're stressed, that's going to be what will produce estrogen if you can talk about those feelings. Now, what women will tend to do, because they're not emotionally intelligent, they think they are, but they're not, about the women that come to me don't know how to do this. That Venus talk means you have to come back to your Venus talk and learn how to communicate in a way that a man will connect with you. If you say, oh, these problems happened today and they said this and they said this, he's going to go, just forget it. No big deal. There's nothing you can do about it. He's a man. That's his reaction. But if you become a woman and you say, you know, I had to fire this person today and I really like them, but I can't afford them anymore. I just feel so disappointed and sad. You know, why does the economy have to be this way? You know, I'm afraid it's not going to be get better anytime soon. You see what you brought in there? You brought in some emotion, disappointment, some sadness, some fear. Men all can relate to emotion. We all can relate to emotion. I can't relate to, I can't relate to the way you talk to other women. You see, you could say to another woman, oh, I had to fire somebody today. It was terrible. And the other woman, knows how it feels to fire someone. And so she doesn't have to say, I feel terrible. I feel sad. I feel disappointed. I feel concerned. I feel worried. I feel helpless. She, you don't have to say that because the other woman can relate to that. But another man hearing the story I had to fire someone today. He's going to be bored. He's not going to be interested. He can't connect with that. He'll just give a solution that would work for him. Well, you got to forget it. You got to do what you got to do. That's the way the world is. You know, there's no free lunch. 
you know, we have these mechanisms inside of us that help us to detach from estrogen so that we can return to testosterone and feel comfort and ease. But women need, and this is what the whole world of therapy is about. This is what therapists all attempt to do is help people get in touch with their feelings. And why is it that 90% of the people go to therapists are women? Because they will benefit most by it. However, they don't always get the results that I got and get because I make sure I get women to get in touch with their emotions and validate those emotions and not agree with the content of it. You see, what you want to validate is that I understand that feeling. I feel empathy for that feeling. I feel compassion for what you went through as opposed to just jumping in there and solving the problem. So Venus talk looks like you say to a man, I just want to talk for 10 minutes about what happened today. And I want to share some of my frustrations, disappointments, and I don't need you to talk me out of it. I don't need a fix. I'm quite cap capable of doing that, but I just want to feel closer to you. I want to reveal, I want to take off my clothes emotionally and just share what I can't share in the workplace. Because if you don't have emotions coming up in the workplace, if it's stressful, then you're just in denial of who you are. Because that's the female side of us that has these negative emotions and they need to be heard. And you don't have to pay a therapist to do it. You can have your husband do it by just simply teaching him. I just need 10 minutes. You don't have to say anything. As a matter of fact, I prefer you not say anything. <laughs> just listen. Just if, listen. Nod your head occasionally. And after about eight minutes, I'll share why, how good I feel and thank you and give you a big hug. And he'll have done nothing except give his presence to you. And as he practices, he actually learns something that the Buddha said was the greatest gift of the world, learning how to feel compassion for somebody, not feel sorry for them, because she's not saying you should pity me. She's saying, look, I have all these feelings. I just want to share them and then I'll feel good again. So see what that is. It's not feeling sorry. And many strong women don't want anybody feeling sorry for them. And many strong women don't even know that they have this vulnerability hidden inside of them that when it's revealed and touched with love, just simply these present for you, then you feel I can become emotionally naked. Then when you get emotionally, physically naked, your body surges to orgasmic ecstasy for a lifetime. That's fantastic. And very yeah, it is. It is. Often it's like these concrete things you can actually do, just like very simple, give a man some uh, cave time or the man actually checks the cave time and then make sure you have these Venus talks once in a while. Time is running fast. John, I have a ton of stuff that I would love. I'll, I'll try to give short answers. Yeah. I'll try to do them short now. Okay. So what I really liked about the book was how it goes into also a woman's circle and different things uh, and how to actually, um, if you really want to be the best man for your woman, how to treat her different at the different times. One thing um, that you might have written about in other books, but that I'm sure that you have some uh, opinions on is how do you select the right partner and how do you know that you're with the right partner? Would you want me to talk about the cycle or to know you're with the right partner? Um, how to select the right partner. So that was more just a enticing <laughs> for the people listening to listen to the book. Okay. In the book, you'll learn at what times of the month and why would you need to know that? Because a woman's body being different from a man's has a cycle of hormonal changes that occur that allow her to have the potential when she ovulates to make a baby. And if she doesn't make a baby, then how the potential to start over. And if she does have a baby, then another hormonal blend that gets produced. So at those times, we have to recognize that time together where he is literally being selfless for you, that's most important at times where your body estrogen level needs to be at its highest. And then there's times where you don't need your estrogen level to be happy at its highest, but you actually need another hormone. You still need estrogen, but you need more than a man, but you need progesterone. And their progesterone has to be higher than a man. And certain behaviors stimulate progesterone, certain behaviors stimulate estrogen, particularly the Venus talk or romance or making love or whenever he's helpful to you around the house. Okay, so these are all things now you feel vulnerable. And then right at five days after your period, you have a blend of both your male and female sides. And then you go more to your female side, then you come more to your female side that's more selfish, do things for you, but not depending on someone, but more depending on yourself. So that's a whole three chapters of a big book, okay, to go into the subtleties of what behaviors will stimulate estrogen, what behaviors will stimulate progesterone, and he learns at what time of the month to make sure you do those dates, when the sex is going to be the best, when you need to have more foreplay, all these kind of things. 
But now coming back to how do you know if you're with the right person? I wrote a book oh, called Make the Right One as well. Oh, okay. But for women, what you want to know is that is a man more interested in you than you're interested in him? Then let him give more to you. And when he gives more to you than you give to him and he continues and you continue to, and then you fall in love with him, he's the right guy. There are generally you find the wrong guy because you're a people pleaser and you're trying to make him happy. You're trying to please him. And it should be more the dynamic, more, not all, but more where he is successful in pleasing you more than you're trying to please him. Now, why is that so? It's biological. If you're doing all this, if you're pursuing him, you're taking a risk, you're going after him, you're seeking to serve him, you're seeking to please him. Those are all qualities of our masculine side of wanting to give. Giving is our male side. Receiving is our female side. Penetrating, like when I'm listening to you, I'm penetrating you. That's a Venus talk. He's get, And he's also serving you by giving you what you asked him to give you, which is 10 minutes of undivided attention and hearing you and not trying to fix anything and then giving you a big hug afterwards. You see, anytime a man is doing something that fulfills something meaningful to you and that you're vulnerable, you have a need, he fulfills that, you have a wish, he fulfills that, you have a preference, he takes that in consideration, fulfills that. He's on his male side, building, using his testosterone, raising it up, feeling successful, and you're feeling uh, grateful, appreciative, trusting, allowing, accepting, that's your softer side. Does it mean you have to be that all the time? No. Do we have to go back in time where women follow their husband and do what their husband says? No, not suggesting that at all. I'm saying that if you're a woman and you're a strong, independent woman, and any degree of that, of independence, okay, now you have to go to equal amount on your female side. You have to become more vulnerable than any woman in history if you want to be happy because you're more independent than any woman in history. And that takes new skills. You have, just like you had to learn how to get through the glass ceiling and do all that stuff you do. That's all it takes knowledge. Well, you've got to learn how to come back to your female side more than your mother, more than your ancestors. And that's what therapy has told us is that women get happier, so much happier and men have stress if they can talk to somebody about their problems and their emotions and their feelings. And a lot of women are so tough, they go, I don't need that because nobody's ever given them. You don't know what you don't know. See, that's the whole thing here. This is the new world we're living in. You don't know what you don't know, but you intuitively feel there's more and there is more, but you don't, if you don't have it today, you can't get it until you change your ways. That's for men and that's for women. So how do you know what they're what you're the right guy? And men, how do you know she's the right woman for you? Is that she doesn't seek to please you, but you feel successful in winning her over and that she makes you feel strong. She makes you feel right. She makes you feel confident. She makes you feel hard. <laughs> but any woman can do that for you. <laughs> and what, what I'd be remiss, because we're talking about biohacking here, is I need to report a study. Because you can't know if somebody's right for you unless you bond first. Now, how do you bond first? Is that men easily bond with their genitals, okay? But wait till you bond with a woman in her mind and then in her heart, and if you're still turned on to her, then you've got a potential partner to be right with. If you just start out with sex right away, it, of course you can be sexual, but can you feel sexual after you hear the way she thinks? Can you be sexual with her after she shared her heart with you? Then you can be sexual with her. Then you have the potential with some, some new skills as well of having a long lasting relationship. Don't rush into it. Know that there's stages. I talk about those stages in my book, Mars, Venus on a Date. The first stage is you're hot and heavy, excited, it's attraction. You feel turned on to her, whatever. Then when you start to feel like maybe she could be potential, and that's the whole point. You say, maybe they're potential. Maybe I want to have a, long, a more monogamous relationship, a special relationship. If I'm thinking about getting married. Maybe she could be the one. Who knows? At that point, when it's good, you'll go into uncertainty. It's natural. You know, I think about putting money down on a new house. You're going to go, wait a second, wait a second. I need to uh, hire some people to see what's wrong with this house. And that's what our brain does. Literally uh, buying a house with my daughter the other day, uh, a few years ago. And we then had to hire somebody to see everything that's wrong with the house before we would buy it. Well, that's what happens in the uncertainty stage. Once you start feeling like, maybe I'm going to buy this house, naturally, 
this uncertainty will come up. And during that uncertainty, men tend to cave and women tend to get needy and they want to know, what do you feel? What's going on? Let's talk about the relationship. Where's it going? Why is she needing that reassurance? She's in the uncertainty stage. He's going to back up and go to his cave. That's him and the uncertainty stage. So what do you do at those times is you don't push for reassurance at that time, but he needs to focus on his, what makes him happy without going to another woman to be happy. And she needs to focus on going to her friends, defining her happiness, giving space for them to come back together. And that uncertainty stage, you go through it back and forth several times. You sabotage it if his pulling away and she feels hurt by that or she feels demanding of reassurance at that time. So rather than can be concerned if she, from her point of view, is he the right guy for me and try to ask him, you should look inside yourself. Well, how do I feel in this relationship? If you feel ignored and, and, and neglected while he's in his uncertainty stage, you don't understand men. And you'll sabotage it by running after him or seeking reassurance. That's when you need to know yourself and realize I'm being needy, demanding more right away. I need to find a fullness from my life. I need to reconnect in other areas of my life because I need connection for estrogen. Then he will come back and he will come back if he's the right guy. And you have to realize this is the big theme in Men Are From Mars. It's still true hormonally. Men get close. Estrogen goes up. Testosterone goes down. They need to pull away. They pull away. Testosterone comes up. Now they miss her. They want to be with her. He comes back to her. And is a, he's like a rubber band. He pulls away to spring back. So we have to go through that. You know, you ask me, how do you know? You go through that uncertainty stage and you don't have sex with anybody else during that time. That sabotages it. And I want to mention sex is so powerful. If you want to create, we're, we're talking about a soulmate relationship where you have passion for a lifetime, where you grow in love over time. You have to grow in a relationship. And one part of it is not, not, you have to realize sex is a big part of that. And too much sex is a big part of that can be a problem. You need to have regular sex. Now, what was great about this is. So what's regular sex? How often is that? Well, I'm just going to look to science and you can always break the rules of science and know that you find balance again. But here's the regular, the, the science shows there's studies have been done in Japan and they show that if a man goes for six days, has sex and then goes for six days without ejaculating. So he has sex and he ejaculates. There's a hormonal change that happens when you ejaculate. And it's different if you ejaculate alone or with a woman. Uh, if you ejaculate with someone you care about, your body produces prolactin, which sort of frees you from the male addiction to masturbation. See, right now, most men are addicted to masturbation, which keeps their testosterone levels at base level. But what has been found out, if you don't masturbate, you have sex on Saturday, say, and then go for six days without ejaculating. You can have sex if you know how to have sex without ejaculating, which I do. And I think it's a good thing to learn. You can read books on it. But you go for six days without ejaculating. If you're a man, on the seventh day, your testosterone levels are going to be 50% higher than your baseline. 50% higher. Now, what happens when your testosterone is 50% higher? We have other research that shows that when a man's testosterone levels go really high, his, no, his body smell puts out pheromones. And these pheromones cause women's estrogen levels to go up. So all you have to do is have surges in testosterone. A woman's estrogen will go higher and then you experience a more complete bonding. And that's how you really know somebody's right for you is when you can hit, when you get 50% higher with her than with anybody else. Nobody else can cause me to go to 50% except my partner. And now I have, I'm at 70 years old. My testosterone levels are 50% higher all the time than when I was a young man. And when I have sex, they go 50% higher again. So it's like unbelievable ecstasy and fantastic and wonderful. That's possible, but you have to build up that. Like a, you have to be, you have to be able to do, you know, you have to, be able to do abs. You've got to have strong muscles. You've got to be in your male energy. You can't have a lot of body fat to be able to do that. But most men today, a lot of men are weak. You know, they're addicted to sex. They do all this porn stuff and all that. And they watch videos of other people having sex. You know, when I was a young guy, I did that thing. That was going to be really cool. But my wife, Bonnie, she, she, she's like a real person. She said, this is silly. They're just acting. That's all fake. Don't you want me? I said, yeah. I turned it off and I never watched it again. 
is the silliest thing if you're connected to real sex, real ecstasy, as opposed to fake. And that's what you want. You asked about how do you know your partner is the real one for you? You practice abstinence for six days and then you go for it. And then you practice abstinence for six days. And then always on that seventh day, you will hit that big number, cause her to go that big number. And then you can bond. And then if they're the right person with that bonding, you'll have the confidence to commit your life to them. And if every week you hit 50% higher, you do that for a few months, you'll never be attracted to another woman longing for her. You'll see them all as beautiful, but not like, I'd like to get laid or maybe it's a temptation, whatever. Just can't even think about having sex with another woman. Why would I want to do that? It was foolishness. It's like somebody said a long time ago, it's like, why would I go to a McDonald's when I have a T-bone steak at home? And you just, it, it's so lowering because see, if you just have sex, you're an animal. <laughs> we are humans. You want ecstasy. You want super brain power. You want great hormone balance. You, you want love. You know, that's what we're trying to get to here is real love, which means you know, if, if I get angry, for example, yeah, I'm not a perfect person right away. If I'm ever angry, I apologize right away. I'm so sorry. I, I got angry. I'm going to take my cave time. I'm going to come back. I'm going to make it up to you. Men have to understand that your job is never to be angry at their partner. If you do, you're out of balance. You apologize right away. Women need to hear that. And then they feel safe to be angry because <laughs> they can apologize too. You see, we need to make it. We need to get that as soon as you have negative emotion, you're throwing on your partner, you should apologize right away. He said, you know, I know I'm throwing this on you. I'm so sorry about that. You don't deserve that. I need to go find my time. Women need to go talk to a therapist or a friend or a girlfriend or journal. You need to get it out for sure. But not on him if you're feeling blame. Blame destroys relationships and everybody does it. Everybody does it. And so you, when you do it, you have to just go, okay. I'm a monkey right now. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. I got angry. I need to need a little space and I'll be back. You know, and I'll, I'll, I know our time's running out, but I share one sweet story about Bonnie after about, you know, we married for 34 years, but tw 23 years into the marriage, I was around 20. I said, how do you rate me as a husband? And she said, as a father to our children, you're like A plus. You're like the best father I could ever imagine. As a husband, you're not perfect. <laughs> and then she said, and that's another good thing. You see, I don't, she doesn't demand perfection of me. I don't demand perfection of me. We have ecstatic lovemaking. Who cares about perfection? Then, so they, she said, as a husband, you're not perfect, but you've given me the greatest gift any woman could want. I said, what's that? She said, I know I can say things or do certain things and it upsets you a lot. And whenever you're upset, you stop talking, you go to your cave. And every time you come out of that cave with more love and the key there is more love. You see, that's how you grow in love is you make mistakes. You recognize your mistake. You sincerely apologize and you change a little and you make a mistake and you apologize and you change a little. And therefore you're growing and you only can change and grow by recognizing what I did wrong. It doesn't happen any other way. <laughs> it's just, it's, I made a mistake. Let me correct it. Let me be a wiser person. That's why I've got 20 books. They're all my mistakes <laughs> that I learned something from. I learned something from. It's growing. And so then what your love grows is, is if you are able to be fully vulnerable, which means she can share anything with me, but she does it in such a way that doesn't like blame me in the end. She can say, you know, this is my stuff. I realize it. My feelings were just coming up and I love you, honey. And I'm sorry. Apologies for how, for being out of balance basically and coming back and knowing that nobody's perfect, but it's more dangerous in a relationship for men to express anger than women. When a man expresses anger, you have to realize that biologically speaking, it's a major fight or flight response in a woman because when men get angry, bad things happen. When women get angry, you may not get loved. <laughs> you may not, you may sleep on the couch, okay? So, <laughs> but your life's not in danger, at least for most men. But when a man is angry, it pushes a button. Even though it's irrational, he would never hurt you or anything. And some men would, but most women wouldn't. And that's irrational. Doesn't matter. It's a fight or flight response and they can get stuck in that and remember that for a long time. So you start to get angry. You, if you can stop that, okay, excuse me. You know, my wife, we had, she'd say, you're being mean. 
And I said, okay, okay, I can be soft. I can be soft. No, I'm not talking to you. I said, no, 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 I'm here. Well, she said, you can talk with your heart. I'll stay in this conversation. And I own that. I didn't justify it. It's true. I don't want to be this mean guy. I don't want to be an angry guy. And if I get angry, what she said, I know I can upset you, which means you get angry. You stop talking, you go to your cave. And what she doesn't know is that many times I'm angry and I stop my anger because what you can do to stop anger, men, is ask questions. And I want to leave this with the men listening, which is the power is when a woman is talking, you're starting to get triggered. That's your stuff, your insecurities, you know, getting triggered. You're feeling blamed and now you want to fight back and defend yourself. How you feel out of control, basically. How do you come back into control? My, my lips got dry. How do you come back in control? You ask questions. Now you are directing the narrative. And what questions do you ask? You say, help me understand that better. It's a magic phrase. Just help me understand that better. Tell me more. What else? So rather than resisting, which is only going to cause your estrogen levels to soar and your testosterone to go down, instead of resisting, instead of pursue, go into her, do the opposite. See, that, that's always the key. What you're doing doesn't work sometimes. Just do the opposite. But if that doesn't work, we're not perfect. Then you say, okay, time out. And you take your time. And in the beginning, she's going to go, how could you do that? You don't love me, whatever. Don't speak. Don't speak. <laughs> whatever you say is now words to argue with. You know, when you've been um, sued, you go to a deposition your lawyer says, say the least amount of words. Don't speak. Try to give your answer short because anything you say can be questioned and more things can come out, whatever. The less you say, the better, even though she wants you to say more because she's feeling insecure, but she's trying to penetrate you and that's pushing her into her male side. You'll go to your female side and now you're defensive, you're emotional. You need to cool off. And you can just say that. I just need some time to think about it. I'll, we can talk later. And then when you come back out of the cave, you don't talk right away. You don't say, okay, now let's talk about that thing that upset me or upset you. You come back and you stroke her hair. You do something nice for her. You talk about something else. You relax. You create a soft space. So everybody's like, all the defensiveness is down. Then you can tackle whatever it was that was bothering the two of you. And that you thought about it and you think, and always a good apology works, men, when you've been in the cave, come back out. It was an upset. And then you go away. And you're like, you know, we're shut down. And that's another distinction I'll just quickly make, Mads, because it's such a difference between men and women when it comes to shutdown. Shutdown is an experience of absolutely no emotion. And a man, that's different from the cave. The cave is just, I just need to stay away from getting emotional in my intimate relationship. I need to be more independent for a while. But shutdown is it, some men, when they're triggered, Okay, if they've witnessed violence as a child, they become violent. Okay, that's some people. I, I've never been violent, couldn't be violent because uh, I never witnessed it uh, as a child. Okay, that just wasn't a part of my upbringing, never had any violence, never punished or anything. So that never happened to me. So if to the degree a man has witnessed violence, when he shuts down, he can become violent. But what a shutdown is in a really nice, wonderful guy like me, if he shuts down, if he feels triggered and strong emotions come up, he will have to have a strong push to push it down. And so he will shut down and there'll be no emotion. And it, it could last for days. And, you know, for some men, it lasts their lifetime because they didn't know how to get out of it. But the idea here is that on a dime, a man could be trying to solve your problem and nothing he says works. So then he says, well, then I don't care. And there's a mechanism that goes down after feeling unappreciated for all his attempts. It would just push a button and he'll shut down in an instant and he could open up in two days and one day and it's like completely gone. You don't have to do anything. It's gone. And women don't have that experience. If a woman shuts down, it's because she's been slowly shutting down for years until she has no feeling. So it takes a long time for a woman to fully shut down to a man and then she stays shut down. Uh, it's tough. It's tough to get her to open up again. But for him, all you need to do is ignore him for a couple of days and he'll come out of his cave like nothing happened. That's what you have to learn about men is that, but it's terrifying to a woman because if he shuts down, she's thinking, 
oh, he must be feeling awful for months, for years. He's been feeling this way till finally he's shut down. And we are very, very different. It's like, think of the metaphor of a brick wall. And every time you have an upset and it doesn't get resolved with love, it's like putting a brick in front of your heart. You're building a wall over time. And all these little things, they don't get resolved with love and understanding and compassion and great sex. So, and that's a big part of it too. You got this wall and you're building it and building it to find the wall is blocking the heart completely. So you're shut and that. If a woman, she'll shut down. That's her shut down. There's just no room for change here. For a man, every time one of those bro if a real block goes in there, he can be, he'll shut down for a day or two days. And it's as if there's a huge wall up. And then just leave him alone and be happy doing something else. It'll come down. It's just up, down. But slowly he can build a wall like a woman. But the shutting down can happen in an instant and open up in an instant. And that's the difference between men and women. It's really important because women get freaked out. They don't understand men, the cave thing, why men interrupt them as solving problems, why men need to pull away, why men get angry, why you shouldn't ask them questions. The worst thing you should do if a man is angry is ask him questions. Why do you feel that way? Well, how could you do that? Well, why didn't you do that? Well, if you love me, why couldn't you do this? All that questioning women only makes him angrier because if he talks, he's going more to his female side. He's now going to have the estrogen go higher and higher. Now, the only thing you could do if you want to stop him, and I don't suggest it, but it's what women did for centuries, is when men were angry, what did women do? They said, you're right. <laughs> And so what happens then is that he's getting the loving needs. He's feeling like he's, he can be successful. He's successful. It's so all you have to do is say, you're right. You're wonderful. You're great. You're fantastic. And you push down your emotions. So you have dead emotions. He loses attraction to you anyway over time because your emotions are dead. There's no vulnerability. But at least you saved your life because here's this wild monkey man. And if his testosterone levels start dropping as estrogen goes up, he's out of control. So the way you control at that point is, you know, say you're right. That's what I tell what I, what I say to women, just a normal conversation. You want to have a man be interested in you. You want your husband to really love you more. Just simply put, complain less and say things like good idea. Well, that makes sense. Well, you're right about that. John did it again. He got the right hotel. Oh, he arranged his dinner for us. He did this. Messages of success is what bumps a man up so he can feel more love for you. The love's there. It's just how do you access the feeling of love? And for a woman, the love is there, but how does she get to find that love is don't make her wrong when she's not loving, but get her to express the emotions of not loving, frustrations, disappointments, concerns. And the wise woman does the Venus talk in summary. She comes home a few times a week and shares what actually happened at work and how it made her feel. So she's not pushing her feelings down. And so then they don't get projected on the and sharing. His testosterone goes up because he now knows what he's doing. He's not supposed to solve anything, but he's providing the support that you need so that you can process your feelings and let them go and come back to remembering all of the good things he does for you rather than this temporary amnesia that women get when they're stressed. They forget every good thing you've done and they remember every bad thing you've done. And it's really hard for her to keep her heart open. And then you just... Give her, you know, the time and support she needs to express what those feelings are is one tool, not the only tool, one tool to help her produce massive estrogen and maybe the most powerful, because that's why we have this whole industry of therapy, which is getting women to talk and share their feelings. And then men go into therapy and talk and share their feelings and don't come back. They say, we just talk. That was a waste of time. And some men are away on their female side will enjoy doing that. But Freud, who started this whole thing, he didn't have... He wasn't sitting looking at men. Mostly men came for therapy. It was rich men who were unhappy because money doesn't make you happy. It just makes you more of who you are, unhappy or happy. So Freud, he didn't sit there like therapists today and look you in the eyes and talk to you about how you feel. He did the opposite. It was a low lit room. The man lays on his couch. <laughs> he, Freud stands just behind them so there's no eye contact. The man's in his cave. Basically, he said, and what do you think? And why do you think? And what happened? And why do you think that happened? You're doing this whole analysis thing. That's what analysis is. Analysis is a male quality, sharing feelings at your female side. So it's like what, everywhere. So what you're saying is basically with for men, therapy is better with like, how do you think about that instead of talking about how they feel? So a better coach for men would actually ask them all, what is that? What do you think about that? 
where a good coach for women would ask more about how they're feeling? You know, I have a whole Mars Venus coaching and that's one aspect of it. And let me put yeah. that in practical sense. A woman wants a man to talk. If she says, what do you feel? That's not the direction you want him to go. Just ask him, what do you think about that? He'll always have answers. Why do you think that? Why do you think that? We did, I did a fun thing with my wife for years or she did it with me. Because I always told her, men are very smart. Men are very reasonable. Everything they do is reasonable based upon the information that they have. Okay. It's based upon your foundation. You make sense. And so we watch these movies where guys would do foolish things or politicians would do things that I disagree with and would upset me. <laughs> and she says, well, why do you think he does that? If you say men always make sense. I say, well, if I believe this and this and this, then what he just said would make sense. Because that's what we do. That's our male side. And sometimes we're not on our male side. We're irrational. We're on our emotional side. We're tyrannical. We're demanding. You know, this is what, ha what happens to men when they don't have healthy testosterone levels and too much estrogen. I think you'll enjoy this is like our president, Donald Trump. He's a spoiled brat. His dad gave him $200 million. He never earned anything. See, if a man doesn't earn things, then he doesn't have high testosterone. If you give it to him, it doesn't make him grow. He's got to earn it. And, and that, we're going to be tough on people here, which is a little tougher than what we have been. <laughs> right, quickly before we round off, John. Uh, so just, I'm thinking there are going to be some women out there and men thinking, okay, so that cave time, that sounds like something smart. When is it like, how long can that cave time be? Is it like a half an hour, an hour? Is it a day? Is it like weeks? Or uh, Yeah, right. It's a great question. I've heard it many times. And one answer to that is my wife's unhappy. How long can she be unhappy? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, it's like the, for me, this talks and whatever. It's good to limit it. It's also good to limit that the... the um, the cave time, 30 minutes and occasionally a couple hours, just depending upon where he's at. It has to do also with body type. If you're more of a muscular type, you need less cave time. But if you're stressed, you need more cave time because uh, cave time will always help you to rebuild your testosterone. But if you have plenty of testosterone, then your need to make it is less. If you have your body type and my body type, we're the body type that needs the most cave time. It's because we're basically, we don't have the muscle protection on our body and we do good things all the time, but so we have to rebuild our testosterone and so we have more cave time. And if we take it, you know, on a regular basis, you don't need that much. 30 minutes is generally a good amount. Now, I'm a little different. I, uh, part of my cave time is uh, three to six hours of meditation every day. That's how I came up with the cave. I used to live in a cave. I'm an Indian yogi for nine years. So I'm a master meditator. And so things, I'm totally vulnerable, heartfelt, and so forth. So things can touch me. They don't ever upset me, but they upset, they trigger the childlike part of me from my past. That's where therapy really comes in handy, which is to recognize that when you actually unknow yourself, nothing in present time upsets you. It only, triggers the past. This is why the, the theme today is if you can be in the present, you can manage your stress very effectively. So that, you know, all these being in the present moment is helpful for people. It's a big deal now. You know, I think it's, it's beginner stuff, but it's a good start. You know, for example, just taking three breaths. Now, why is that so valuable? Whenever you're stressed, your primitive brain is dominant and you've lost part of your present time awareness that says, okay, bad things happen. What are we going to do about it? <laughs> I can't change it. Let me look at what I can do. There's nothing really ever to stress us except that we think like a child or like a monkey and we have these automatic reactions. So when you're stressed, if there's a part of us, which is the unconscious causes us to breathe all the time, right? So we're never thinking about breathing, but as soon as you think about your breathing, now you're connecting your prefrontal cortex to the amygdala back here. And now it's no longer the amygdala running the show. You're counting your breath. So you just, you say, I'm going to take a deeper breath than usual. And I'm going to exhale a little longer and take a deeper breath than usual and to exhale a little longer or count it each time. Now you're using the prefrontal cortex of your brain, connecting to the primitive part of your brain. It's the same thing with monogamy. You know, so many people are like, it's so weak. 
You know, it's like men are lusting after this woman, lusting after this woman. You know, men, whenever you lust after a woman who's not loving you, you're an animal. And, and again, a teenager is like a, a, an animal, you know, they're just learning how to be adults and, and to have a high consciousness. You have to regulate your sexual energy in the appropriate situation until you can create a situation where there's love. Then when you ejaculation is when you, your energy is going out. And if it, the love doesn't fill you back up, you just lost out. And, and so this is the, it, it's hard to teach this without sounding moralistic, you know, like you shouldn't masturbate because it's bad. That's the only language people had a long time ago. Everything was good and bad. I don't live in that world. I live in a world of what works and what doesn't work. I'm not here to tell anybody, I, but I tell you what works, what I've seen work. And now we have the science that shows us that if you masturbate once a week, you're going to have higher testosterone levels, at least when you masturbate. <laughs> and, 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 but if you have sex on that day, then even better, you won't be so addicted. It won't be so hard not to masturbate all the time. And you can go for six days without masturbating, without ejaculating. And then you practice that for a while. Then you can start learning how to have sex without ejaculating. And then you can have sex every day, the best sex you can imagine. You can do it for hours, you know, just like I can meditate six hours. I can do sex for six hours, easy. And then the next day, do it again. Although I do feel sore after that. <laughs> <laughs> I <can. laughs> and I don't do it all the time now, but once a day, at least twice a day, having sex when you have time, you yeah. you're, you're a partnership. Now, when my kids were young, you don't have time to do that. You know, I'm 70 years old, so. <laughs> I get a lot of time. I, I, I have a lot of fun. This is what everybody can look forward to. It, and it, but you gotta, you can't just throw your life force away. You know, so it, John, that's part of the tantric tradition where you have sex and you don't ejaculate, but you only ejaculate once in a while. So that's actually like your recommendation in regards to that is if you can have sex as a guy without ejaculating, but learn to get internal orgasm instead. And then it's fine to have sex every single day. Otherwise, you would recommend only to have it every six or seven. Not six, but the six days of abstinence, six days of no. So and I'm only saying that because this, because I've done it my whole life until I stopped ejaculating. But I went for nine years without ejaculating as a monk, you know, to have spiritual experiences like I've had in my life where you can, you know, I used to sit in meditation 18 hours and just shake. Okay. And I'm, it just like, out of the body traveling, all these beautiful experiences. It, it was ecstasy, but it wasn't sexual ecstasy. That's bringing the energy down into the world, which creates a foundation for success. I wasn't successful in the world. I was successful in finding myself and so forth and being happy and fulfilled and spiritual and all that good stuff. But bringing that into the body, the highest thing you can do that I know of is you bring it down into your body, into your mind by developing good ideas and your throat chakra by being creative, you have your own creativity. But when you're bringing the energy down, you're doing it in service to others. Everything's always in service to others. You know, some artists are very creative, but they just do it for themselves, you know, as opposed to how can I make this so it serves others? You care about others, and then you've got the heart, and then you've got the intimacy and monogamy. That's when sex is, can grow with one person and it increases more and more that way instead of throwing it away with other people. Then you bring it down to power center. That's business where you care about others as much as you care about yourself. That's that win-win attitude we see today. And then there's that, the, you know, the sex part of it is then you learn to be orgasmic without ejaculating. You keep the life force in you or you circulate, you give it through love. And sex becomes more about just a physical stimulation so you can feel more deeply the love that's there. I mean, if you think about it, the, the sex by nature has made our sex organs the most pleasurable experience you can have. Okay, why did it do that? Because it wanted you to reproduce, right? So we're animals. You got to keep making babies. Otherwise, the whole thing stops. So the genitals uh, for men and women are the most pleasurable. So when you feel pleasure, what do you do? You don't resist. So pleasure opens us up to feeling. If, you, if something's painful, you don't want to feel it. So you want to push it away. If something's pleasurable, you want to feel it more. And what, what happens through sex is you're able to feel more. And by feeling more, you're able to feel the love that's in your heart. But what also happens is you feel all the suppressed emotions that are inside of you too. And many people don't know how to process their emotions, so they can't feel sexual. There's so many women that are not orgasmic. 
They just can't have orgasms. And so now they resort to male orgasms. They put a little vibrator on themselves and they just have a sneeze. Okay. And that's not a yielding tantric orgasm, Taoist orgasm, where you're surrendering and, and just, you're not doing it to yourself. Someone's doing it to you. That's going to be the tantric experience of allowing and allowing a man to provide. It's not about providing for him. It's about receiving for him. And in your act of receiving, he's receiving back. So her orgasms become your orgasms and your body shakes and does everything a body does when it has an orgasm, but you're really just uniting with her orgasm. It's never about your own. So it's a gradual process of giving up attachment to that release because the orgasm without ejaculation is not a release. You're ready to go again and again and again. <laughs> That's it. There's no off switch. You just have to say, I got a job. I got to go to work now. You know, the kids, be, you don't have that automatic. He's done for a while. You know, it's not like that. And same thing for a woman. She'll be done after a while. She always has her done switch. She feels it's what the French called a, a little, a little death. They call it is she feels she's dying. She's leaving her mind completely. And she goes into her body. And that's the full-blown female orgasm. It's, they just lose their mind temporarily. And it's allowing your body to be animal and at the same time full of love. And there are all these allowings of everything inside of you. And this is what the sages would talk about as being enlightenment. You know, enlightenment is just knowing yourself. But the, the real enlightenment is now bringing that into knowing yourself in your partner. And to make that in simple terms, I know I'm talking on and on, but I have an audience here. I want to just share this one idea and then we'll be done. And that is people, the way you grow in love as a man, I'm masculine and I'm feminine. Now, if I just go to my female side, then I'm just feminine. How to stay in my masculine and also experience my feminine side? Well, I have a relationship with a woman. Now, she is feminine. And she has a male side, but she is feminine. So as I love the parts of her that are feminine, that means I'm embracing it. Then I get to feel my own feminine while I'm on my male side. And that's what sex is. You see, he's being very hard and she's being very soft. And she also is in touch with desire. That's when women are really in touch with their femininity is they want to be filled up. And I was looking at a wonderful book. I didn't come up with this, but I liked it a lot. That woman was trying to summarize masculine energy and feminine energy. And she says, masculine energy is the rock and feminine energy is the desire that rubs against the rock. And I thought that's a great analogy. <laughs> We're like the trees, stable, grounded, rooted, present. We're there, allows her to rub up against us in positive ways and negative ways. And we're unshakable. We're there for her. And that's the act of sex. I mean, I, I, you need to be really hard in your penis and have her vagina become so wet and so soft. You feel so comforted. You know, in the old days, they used to say, you know, what was the role of a woman for a man? And it was primarily to provide comfort for him because his life was painful and difficult and hard. And he experienced hardships to support his family, which was ideally a comfort place. And she would provide comfort for him. And that was her love. It was also her vagina. And, you know, she could ha they could have that, but it would never last. And that's what people have to know. Women often ask me, where are the romantic Romeo and Juliet, you know, guys? I say, well, they were only married for one day. Who <laughs> they died. Had they stayed alive, they would have been the same couple that stopped having romantic sex after a few months. They used to call that the, the romantic phase. But we can have that for a lifetime. But we're only going to have more and more divorce. And so somebody teaches people how to get it. And what we're being taught today will not do it. If you do not understand that men and women are different and they were also the same. Okay. It's like the theme of a university, unity in diversity. Not that we're all the same is that we're all unique and different. And the genders have unique and different qualities that are biological. And when we can nurture those different qualities through relationship then I could be both masculine and feminine without having to give up my masculinity to become feminine. Women don't have to give up their femininity to become masculine, but how to be both at the same time. And that's called hacking the hormones. That's flow state. Flow state is the balance of masculine and feminine. Right now I'm in flow state. So you have to stop me in a moment. <laughs> the river just keeps going. 
it's got 20 books and 20 others that never published. They, uh, John, well, so, so jumping in, did you write a book as well about the, um, these different kind of sexual states and how to get into that as well? I have a, I have a, a, a course on, on sex called Secrets of Great Sex at my website. And I also have a book called Mars, Venus in the Bedroom. Okay. And that one is into like the sex once every seventh day, connecting I, that deeper level. On that does everything I teach about sex except that one, one deal because my, my problem was I didn't have a study to prove it. You can't say things like that and have people say, what? You mean I have to give up sex? You know, I'm not some monk like you. <laughs> you don't have to give up sex. And you can practice. There's so many practices you can do together that don't involve ejaculation. And if you're, you know, the average 45-year-old guy who can't even get an erection anymore with his wife, you can bring it back. Okay, so one technique there. It's, it, first, you can get a divorce and you'll get it back again. A new woman will bring back it. <laughs> But there are ways to stay married, keep your life intact, fall in love again. <clears throat> if you have good sexual practice, which means that you practice not ejaculating except once a week. If you get an erection, if you don't, you just don't wait on, you don't wait till you start getting a directions and start rebuilding your energies again, your vitality. But you give her, keep your clothes on and you give her stimulation towards an orgasm, whether she has one or not, doesn't matter. And you practice that every few days for 10 minutes. You just practice stimulating her sex parts for 10 minutes. You start a little kissing, a little touching, a little massaging, and then some clitoral stimulation for five or 10 minutes. That's what you, and just, Maybe you have to have lubrication in the beginning. But what happens is you give her climax or arousal without her doing anything for you. See, one of the things that kills sex in men is when women are giving to men in sex rather than men are successful in giving to women. A lot of women just sort of put on a show for the man, pretend to have an orgasm, whatever. That will kill his sex drive as well. It literally has to be his body authentically smelling her body getting higher and higher because of what he's doing to her. And that will awaken his instincts. We have a little nose inside of our nose, two little flaps on the inside of our nose. And their only job, their only job is to smell increasing pheromones, which the pheromones that represent increasing estrogen in a woman. If her estrogen levels go up, your testosterone levels go up. If your testosterone levels go up, her estrogen levels go up. These, both those studies are done showing that that increases desire When you're a male and your testosterone levels are peaking, it will raise a woman's estrogen. So, but the same thing, a woman's raised estrogen will cause your testosterone levels to come back. I can't guarantee for every guy who's masturbated his life away, it will come back. But I've had so many men who can't get erections anymore with their spouse. They can get them with, a, with porn. That's another sort of apparent paradox, but it's logical when you understand biology. If you have a fantasy woman and it's even digital, it's even more powerful and it's new and different and it's sexual, it's sending a message to your primitive brain that you're king and all these women want to have sex with you. So that makes that boosts your testosterone right away. And because there's no estrogen being produced, you see, there's no intimacy and there's no love. There's, it's all fake. And so your body will have a higher dopamine response like any drug. And that will give you a temporary surge in testosterone. And then afterwards, it will go down and down and down. Now, you can do searches on Google and say, does ejaculation lower testosterone in men? And they'll say no, because it doesn't. It goes up and it goes back down to baseline. But look at the other research that shows your average man today at 35 and now 20. <laughs> it's so low. But at 35, it goes down every year until he gets to 50 on average. It's half the testosterone he had when he was a grown man. I mean, he was a young man. And, you know, I practice sex, sex energy control, whatever. And at 70, mine's 50% higher. And on the, and well, actually it's 50% higher than when it was when I was younger. It's much higher now than it was. We'll put it that way. When I have sex, it goes even higher. <laughs> I get my extra boost, but I don't have to wait six days because I didn't ejaculate. If you don't ejaculate. Now, the other thing about it is if you're in a, you might think that if you're in a marriage and you're not having sex with your partner, why aren't you getting that extra boost? You need to have sex with your partner once a week. So this is the other side of it. If your partner's not in the mood, you still do a sensual massage. You've got to do that and get arousal and start building. And, and 
then you can be ignored for six days and come back to it. It was build. And then the, the potency of your masculinity will increase simultaneous the potency of her femininity will increase so a man can help a woman go to increasing estrogen a woman can create a man going to increasing testosterone we are interdependent on each other and that's how you you build higher and higher and it's easy to blame your partner but we always have to look at our side of it and make the changes within ourselves and usually we'll get the results we want fantastic so women can get orgasms all the time Men should only ejaculate uh, once a week, but can still have sex to- and learn to uh, to get internal orgasms instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now the the other thing is, there's many women. You know, there's there was many years a big debate: uh, a clitoral orgasm versus vaginal orgasm. And all these women were saying they never had vaginal orgasms; <laughs> they could only have clitoral orgasms and. Look, the the Taoists didn't say one was better than the other. One one is precursor to the other. You know, vaginal organ. After you've had a little clitoral organ, don't build everything up in your clitoris. You'll see a lot of women who masturbate can't lose weight because when you, particularly, you're doing it yourself with a vibrator. They've already shown that desensitizes you and makes you less responsive to a real man. You're just doing it yourself. You're also increasing testosterone. You can go to work to do that. You don't need more testosterone. But what it does, according to Taoism and the Chinese philosophy of medicine, it overstate, overstimulate the clitoris for orgasm. Again and again, you don't go into the vaginal two or three levels of orgasm in the vaginal part, channel. You, you're overstimulating the kidneys. See, different parts of your vaginal canal and the clitoris and your breasts all stimulate different organs. So if you skip certain levels, then you're overstimulating the one you're treating. So if you do only clitoral stimulation, it stems too much stimulation on the kidneys and the kidneys can't regulate water and therefore you get water retention. So you see a lot of these women who really have big thighs and, and larger than they would naturally have, it can be the outcome of water retention. And one of the things that can cause that clitoral stimulation too much. And that the vaginal, you know, it's become more popular the G spot, but then deeper than the G spot, the E spot, and then there's the C spot where the cervix and a woman will come down. But for all that to happen, she needs to have lots of estrogen, and she has to have man's penetration for quite a while, not eight minutes. You know, it needs to be. That's why in the tantric texts and in the Taoist texts, they show all these positions. One of the reasons for the positions is that a man is training himself to never get into the get close to the point of no return. That's where if you stop, your body would say, no, I have to ejaculate. So you have to regulate before you get to the point of no return. You notice that what's coming up soon is an ejaculation. So you stop what you're doing and you change positions. And then you stop what you're doing, you change positions. And you practice that uh, until you can go for long long periods of time but when you can you know a good 30 minutes of intercourse the intercourse part of it usually that can take a woman to three or four orgasms and get to a c spot if she has enough estrogen now if she's a busy businesswoman and worried and stressed she's not going to get it get anywhere you know she can get a porn star nothing's going to happen you you got it she's got to find her feminine place and the Taoists would say that you have to kiss first you have to breathe first And now they teach all breathing exercises before tantric sex, right? That, but that's not the way it was really taught. You see, it's not breathing exercises. I mean, breathing exercises are helpful. But what you do when you're doing the kissing and touching, you're noticing your arousal. Arousal is changing your breathing. And so you become aware that, oh, my breathing is changing. And literally, your breathing does have to change to pump the blood down to your penis. So that's the best part. You need to fully enjoy breathing and enjoying the pleasure of this automatic breathing because automatic breathing you're going into a spiritual state where you're aware that you're not doing anything and your body's doing it for you so you get to this free state just through the breathing and then through the kissing and then you wouldn't even go down south more until the woman is penetrating you with her tongue that's what they call the fringe kissing and it has to be a natural thing but women have to have permission to do it no this is a part of orgasm they would even say each one of these stages is like an orgasm So the kissing is the French kissing where you, you're touching her gently or kissing. But then at a certain point, her testosterone levels are going to start to rise. At that point, 
her tongue's going like, to penetrate into your mouth. And now you go, oh, okay, now you go down kissing her behind her ears, blowing her ears, her neck, different zones women have, but the big ones is the kiss, the breath, and then the, the breasts. And often uh, not enough attention is put on the breasts and sucking of the breasts. The idea of sucking the nipples after they're uh, coming up and they're being aroused, it's feather touch before that. But when the nipples get aroused, then you suck on that, that produces huge amounts of oxytocin. Same thing when a baby sucks the mother's breast, that's what turns on the milk flow. And what turns on the milk flow is oxytocin. So already her oxytocin has to go enough to cause the nipples to contract, to start to rise up. Then sucking on that will actually increase more and more oxytocin, which is the safety hormone as well. Then as that, she starts to feel, I can depend on you. I can enjoy you. I can let you affect me. That's her estrogen levels going up. Now, if she's busy thinking about you and trying to give to you, she's not focusing on learning to receive. There's a whole big thing in my book on sex is women have to get into the mode of receiving and not giving in the sex part. Then you start touching a whole body, starts moving around together. It's another orgasmic experience is sort of loosening up all the joints and everything. Literally, our hormones are changing. Then you go to the clitoris. Then you do clitoris for a little while. Don't just focus on that for the whole show, but just experience the rising pleasure of her wanting more. Then you, you penetrate. And your penetration, you can get to the G-spot. Then you have a, a few orgasms with that. Then you go beyond that is another spot that comes forward. You see, if you want right, right to the G spot, it doesn't feel good right away. It makes her want to pee. And it, you have to wait till the, it fills up. The, the, you feel more blood flow is down there and it's more pleasurable. Then you go to the G spot. Then you go a little deeper. And that's usually orgasmic, several orgasms for her. And if she really is close to ovulation or she's just really good at producing estrogen, then the orgasmic state comes in where her uh, cervix will come down to touch the tip of the penis and every little touch is like an orgasm it's just boom 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 and she loses her mind and you're super stud and then you like feel victorious like you just won the war you know <laughs> it's amazing and you have that every day but you have to learn to not be you know what the buddhist would say is don't be attached to the outcome you have to let go of your attachment to ejaculation it's just who was ejaculate that's all that is is the switch is turning off if you learn for a while to build the energy and build the energy and you've been never ejaculating for quite a while, then those little waves of getting bigger and it goes down, you change positions, goes bigger, it goes down, change position. Every time that wave, it gets bigger and bigger until it eventually becomes orgasmic and the same orgasm, but no ejaculation. Because most men just think orgasm is ejaculation, but actually ejaculation happens right after you have the orgasm. It's that moment of surrender and opening your heart and feeling spectacular. And then your body says, I can't handle that much estrogen. And it shuts off. And then you shut down a bit. And then your testosterone have to build up. So your testosterone level, it's performance, it's selflessness, it's giving, it's success. It's her responsiveness that allows you to maintain your masculinity why you're becoming fully orgasmic feminine because pleasure and ecstasy, that's all feminine. So to be present at the same time, not attached to that, but to, to, to experience love. It's about feeling more and more love, but at the same time, pleasure in the body. So that's a glimpse of it. I just wanted to share that. <laughs> Fantastic. So that's your online course where we can learn more about that or in your book? Well, both. I have it. At, the, the, the online course is fun. It's yep. the information in my book beyond well, Mars Venus in the bedroom. It's right, 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 right there, which is a great book on polar teaching how to use sex to come back to the polarity between men and women. And a lot of that has to do with the technique of starting out where he's more on his female side. She's on her male side because women today are more on their male side. And men are when you're horny, you're on your female side. You're wanting to connect with the female <laughs> as much as we think men are like horny. Because we are the ones way on our male side, we want to get over to the female side. We want to be dependent on the vagina to make us feel good. So we want to be touched. We want to be stimulated. It's just all on our penis. <laughs> like women want to be touched everywhere. Just touch me there, you know, I'll feel love. So we're on our female side. She's on our male side. She's going to accommodate you, satisfy you, please you, act like she enjoys it and all that. But it's all for you. 
So you do a little bit of that, that's step one. And then when the man gets close to ejaculation, where he sees if we continue doing this, I'm going to ejaculate, you go to step two, where you start over. And you start over, and this time, it's like you have signals where she's not allowed to do anything for you and you do for her. And then she can fully receive and she can have orgasm. Then step three is then you have intercourse and now it's for both of you. Because women, if you have an orgasm, they can keep going if you still got a solid erection. Whereas if a man loses his erection, it's, you know, she can stimulate herself, but it's not a real orgasm. It's uh, she feeds on his energy of attentiveness, focus, presence, love, desire for her. Anyway, that's that is uh, talked about in Mars, Venus in the bedroom. The only thing I leave out of that is, is the whole idea of you need to have six days of abstinence because I couldn't say that. I did that and it was a little embarrassing for me because here I'm this expert in sex, writing books on sex. And people said, how much sex do you have? I say, well, I do it once a week. <laughs> they say, what? Only once a week? I say, it's so good. I don't need more. <laughs> and but you see, people, there's so much pressure on people to have sex two or three times a week. Otherwise, we're not doing it enough. And those very people stop having sex in their 40s. You know, there's like half the people stop having sex when they're married. And certainly they say they want to bring back the spark. Just go for, do this technique of six days abstinence. And the problem is, is that women usually are absent. This is on the male side. If his sex is boring with his wife, he's often doing it with with the porn on online it's so common today he doesn't know that's gonna you have sex with your wife on saturday and then you do a little porn on tuesday on saturday you have sex with your wife again it's not going to go 50 percent higher it's going to be mediocre sex it's going to be routine sex it's not going to be this falling deeply in love ecstatic i love you i adore you and take you in you're mine i'm yours we're one you know this is what we can have and then Life, dis it dissipates, you know, you don't stay in that state altogether. Your energy goes out and it blesses other people. Your children are enriched by it. Your work is enriched by it. And you're in the flow state. Flow is when you're on your male and female side at the same time. And that's what we all can aspire towards now. And that's biohacking our brain and our heart and our body through sex, through making love and through abstinence at the right times and the right times to have sex. Same thing with eating, not eating too much. And for men with testosterone, big testosterone builder is fasting. You know, somebody, we were at the dinner table at the, the wedding this weekend, and my partner was saying, they were saying, you know, somebody fasted for three days. And my wife said, my, Nikki, my partner now, she said, John does 40 days. He'll do three days with no water. You know, this, see, this is discipline. This is power. You know, when you have that power over your body, you say to your body what you want it to do, and it does it. And I don't do it all the time, though. I, you know, I like ice cream, <laughs> <So> <laughs> which, which puts extra belly fat on me. A little, just a little extra. But when I get to my ideal body mass index, I, then I'll start having ice cream again. And then when it goes up, I'll stop. So I can regulate it. You know, I'm not like this extreme guy I was when I was a monk. You know, a monk, I just ate a bowl of food a day, slept on the floor, practiced meditation, did yoga, all that stuff. It was with preparation. I was a celibate monk. I was a personal assistant to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi of the Transcendental Meditation Movement. And uh, that was before I, you got married? To yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was uh, nine years. And I pure celibate. And what I discovered was none of the other guys were pure celibates. They were all masturbating. Head oh. I, I never masturbated for nine years. I had lots of sex as a teenager. I love sex, but then I gave it up. You see, when you give up personal indulgence, it increases testosterone. It's an amazing thing. Makes you feel powerful when you can control your behavior. You say you're going to do something, you do it. And you can control your body. You can control your mood. You can control sex. You know, these powers come to, particularly for men, is really necessary. And for some of that for women, for sure. But women have to learn how to find love. How to, their power is to come back to love again and again. When negativity comes up, to let it go with forgiveness, with acceptance, with understanding, with trust. Trusting again is a big deal. For a man, it's when you fail picking up and, and taking a risk again. You know, I'm going to try again. I'll try again. I'll try again. And not settling for mediocre. You know, we all have giants inside of us that want to come out. <laughs> 
I don't know where that giant thing came from. I was listening to Tony Robbins the other day. I guess that's where that came from. He is a giant, you know? <laughs> he is a giant. Uh, just fantastic. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. All right. We had a great time. Thank you, man. <laughs> John, before we uh, round off, where can people find out the, the information about you? I'll make sure to put in the show notes. Oh, sure. MarsVenus.com. And just is it MarsVenus.com. And, you know, what's very nice for couples to watch, because, you know, when you talk theory, everybody can argue, whatever. We tell stories that people relate to. And I did two tech t- TED Talks. One's no good. It's more intellectual. Because it was San Francisco audience. Nobody was in relationships. Okay. So how do you talk with people? <laughs> they're, they're all Volk, you know, back <laughs> there. Sex doesn't exist for them. Gender doesn't exist for them. I'm sitting here talking. To, not my audience. But if you're in a relationship or you, you want to be in a relationship with someone of the opposite sex, particularly go to the TED Talk on YouTube uh, where I'm wearing the red shirt. I, it was just, it was a thousand couples, you know, put me in a room with a thousand couples and I'm a mind reader. They all said, that's just what happens to us. That's just what happens to us. And you can experience the truth of what I'm saying, not because it's somebody's theory or my theory or whatever. And of course, you know, the science stuff I talk about now is really good, but the stories are great and people can laugh at it, whatever. And that will loosens us up instead of all this strict, we can't talk about gender. That's just, that's the transition. It's not bad. It's we had to let go of old fashioned stereotypes in order to say women can be like men, men can be like women. Now we say, I'm a man, I can go to my female side, women can go to their male side. Now, how about women being on your male side and your female side? And how about men being on your female side and being on your male side at the same time? And when you balance that, genius comes forth. That is the foundation of genius, is being both the left and right hemispheres of the brain working together in harmony. And I have to thank uh, Transcendental Meditation, actually, is how I started out in the meditation field. Have you heard of that? You know that? Yeah. We did the research back in 1970 on my brain showing brain synchronization. And they did a whole big study on mine and other meditators, how when you go into meditative states, you're using both of the sides of the brain start to go into harmony. That's a foundation, but it's not going to give you relationship skills. I'll tell you, <laughs> I tell you from experience, I could go to my cave and be happy, but to be happy and fulfilled when somebody is different from you is a different story. And when you love them more, you see, this is such an important thing for women to understand. When you love someone more, it's going to evoke inside of the worst part of you. That's why you need to have all these skills to deal with that and know that the foundation of psychology is that when you feel safe, your heart is open, you'll be triggered. It's like PTSD. If you have a traumatic childhood, which for some point, to some degree today, we did have a traumatic childhood. Now, based on our standards of today, based on the standards of the past, it wasn't traumatic. That's why everybody keeps living in the past, how terrible the past was. Yeah, had bad things and good things. Just, you know, I grew up in Texas, you know, my dad for the other brothers, they didn't do this with me, but they did it with my other brothers. He, they would misbehave. He'd pull out the belt and whip them. That was done in Texas. It's still done in Texas. We go, ah, can't even imagine that in school. They tried to hit me with a paddle. I said, I'm out of here. I'm, I left out. I left the school when they did that. I said, I'm out of here. I said, I'm not going to, you can't do that to me. That principal said, you know, Gray, you're this far from being kicked out. I said, no, you can't kick me out. I'm leaving. And I got up and left school just like that. You know, it was horrendous to me because I had never been punished that way. Other people had been punished. It was just the way life was in those days. And now we're going back in America like crazy people, tearing down statues and all this crazy stuff about how bad the past was. Yeah. And look about how good the past was too and how it brought us to this time now. So what we're going through is a transition where we're letting go of the limitations of what it means to be a man. You can also be a father. You love your kids. You can be a romantic. You can actually decide not to join the army and not kill people. You know, you can be this loving guy, <laughs> but then you've got to come back and say, hey, how do I become a man then without killing people? How about being someone who is selfless and service and have commitment and focus and do something good in the world? How to have both at the same time? And then the same thing for women, how to be independent, how to be confident, how to express yourself, articulate yourself, but have to be soft and vulnerable, have tender feelings of love and affection and get in touch with your need to be loved 
You need to have a man romance you. You need to have a man fuck you. You know, this is like amazing stuff. This is femininity. You want to be penetrated by a man. Women, Jerry, what do we need men for? This is what, this is sort of having to leave the old state. You go, you know, from one extreme, we go to the other extreme, and now we can come back and find balance. You know, this is possible for people, but we have to see through the illusion of this gender neutrality. Gender neutrality goes nowhere, but it does provide a foundation to say, let me let go of the past and let me create a new person. And the new person is to blend the integration of male and female within us. And that is who we are as a soul. See, as a spiritual person, I know my soul is both masculine and feminine, but I, I got a male body. You see, women got a female body. This body that we're inhabiting and driving with our spirit and soul, we're not driving it if it's controlling us. We have, and whenever your hormones are out of balance, you're not in control. We know this to be the case. Blood flow actually lessens to the control center in your brain if your hormones are out of balance. And what does it mean to have hormones out of balance? It means stress hormones are being produced because at the same time, women are not making enough estrogen or progesterone. Men are not making enough testosterone. Men are making too much estrogen. Women are not making enough. They're making too much testosterone. So it's so simple when you get the basic plumbing of what does it mean to be a man? What things trigger that plumbing? What things trigger the plumbing for a woman? That's your baseline. Then you can go over and express a little out of balance here, a little out of balance here until now you can integrate it so all the time you're on your male and female side and what does that look like well like in the workplace you're always happy and you love your work and you're passionate what does it look like in your relationship you can have sex every day you adore each other you love each other just like you got a glimpse of when you fell in love that's possible and you get an argument it, it lasts a very short period of time as a man I, I do this i know this stuff now i just go help me understand that better okay tell me more all right, I'm starting to get a little angry. I'm really sorry because I really want to understand. <laughs> so let me tell you what you just said. This is easy stuff once you learn it. Just like a professional basketball player. It's easy stuff to throw a hoop every time. Throw it in, throw it in, throw it in. You know how many hours they practice that stuff? It takes a lifetime to master this stuff. But we're all going in the wrong direction today. It's the wrong direction. The right direction would say we're no longer limited by stereotypes. Let's be both masculine and feminine but let's not integrate it, how to do that. And relationships is the way to do it. I find it extremely uh, weird that we don't learn about any of this stuff in school. Like we learn about math. I've discussed it with my girlfriend earlier. Like how do we, uh, how, is, how did it happen that we have to learn about math? We have to learn to read. We have to learn how to drive a car. So many things we spend time on, but we spend no time on learning how to speak to another person and how to show them love, that we just expect that we show them at the same way as we preferred, right? If you really love someone, you would spend the time, in my opinion, and of course it's different, but you should spend the time of actually going into it. Like I read more than five books, now seven, with your uh, two books as well, about relationships, because I realized like I'm at a stage in my life now where I want to get better at this. Uh, now I've focused on career for many years and traveling around, but like with anything else, I study something to get better at it. We don't learn about this in our life, which is crazy. Well, I really appreciate being on your show today. It's been a delight. Thank you, John. And thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time. Thank you.